chapter 3. It's a practice of mine uh, to come here each Sunday morning and if it hasn't been done already, turn on the heat, turn on the lights, so on and so forth. You could argue, quote unquote, a church our size, the preacher shouldn't have to do that. That is not my approach to this. I live 600 yards. To my knowledge, there's no church member that lives closer. And so I learned early on in pastoring that, yes, wise is the pastor that delegates as much stuff as he can. But also wise is the pastor that doesn't see himself above any task in the church. And so at this point, that's part of my Sunday routine, and I love it. Because one of the things that I do, well, for one thing, it motivates me to get up because there's nothing more chilling to the Holy Spirit than a chilled 70-year-old woman. Yeah, some of you got it. Yeah. So when it's your job to turn on the heat and it didn't get done, whoo, yeah. And, and I, I respect that. I truly do. With that said, about right over there on that landing coming down the stairwell is where I've been through half of the process. And usually, 99 times out of 100, I have not yet, quote, unquote, prayed through my daily morning worship time. And so it's about on that landing that I will stop. And I'll just pray through. And again, it's always a wonderful experience. I just meet with the Lord. Well, this morning, you know, it's almost April. It's almost Easter. And there's something going on in rural world right now. And that is the turkeys are getting ready to start doing what they do. And there's very few things that thrill me more than hearing a turkey. Where's Jerry Drummond's at? There you go. Yeah, very little that excites me more in the in the you know hunting world. So I decided I would do my quiet time outside, just in case the Lord wanted to bless me with a, a gobble close <laughs> on property I can hunt. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Come on. So. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Yeah, dang it, somebody said. But let me tell you what did. Me and the Lord, we had a sweet time. And by the time I got to that office, I was in tears. And I was moved. And this may be weird as all get out, but sometimes I think in the processes of what would I say to a bunch of preachers if I ever got a chance to say it. And this is one of those things. If I were sitting where you're sitting, I want my preacher to be moved to tears in his worship time. I want my preacher to be moved to tears on my behalf. I want my preacher to spend time in that book. I want him to have something to say to me when I get there. And, folks, you will be the deciding factor if that happens today. I'm not trying on any level to build up as much as I'm telling you that when God's man preach to you, preaches to you God's word, God is trying to talk to you. And he, and he has something to say. And today's message, as controversial as it is in the world should be totally accepted in these four walls and should be practiced and put to work in your four walls at home and the world will see a transformed people as a result. And so I'm asking you to stand to read 1 Peter chapter 3. He's speaking to the dispersion. He's speaking to persecuted, scattered Christians and they are, he's trying to prepare them for what is to come. The, the persecution, if you will, from Nero, the emperor of Rome at the time that blamed Christians for everything. And he's trying to prepare them for that. And now, in preparation, he's teaching them practical daily 
holiness. And very honestly, it, it's not a surprise to the Bible or to the Bible student that that includes submission. That is completely, totally misunderstood in our world today, but it needs to be completely understood in any Christ-honoring church. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, likewise be submission to your own husbands. Not even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arraigning the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Father, we ask you to add your blessings to the reading and preaching of your holy word. Again, Father, change us to look more like you. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. You may be seated. The title of this message is Winning the Lost by Losing the Battle. Winning the lost by losing the battle. As I told the first service, a uh, preacher, professor of mine said, uh, Preacher boys, you've got one job at the beginning of the message. You've got one job in the introduction, and that is to get your people out of the depot onto the train. Your train is the message, but when they show up, they're in the depot. And if you don't get them into the train at the beginning of the message, guess who's not going to be there at the end of the message? Your people. They're still going to be in the depot, but that by that time they're fishing, they're hunting, they're shopping, you know, who knows? Uh, they're working uh, and the such. So I'm begging you right now, these next few words are to get you onto the train. In the Christian life, winning is losing, and losing is winning. What I mean by this is as Americans, we are obsessed with winning. And that's okay until it takes on a worldly take. And I'm not shooting at any fathers here, but we've all hopefully grimaced at the father that told his son, second, well, that's just the first loser. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully you grimaced at that. Because the reality is, is that effort is the key. Church, can I tell you that God set me free when I discovered that Outcome is out of my control. Effort is what I'm supposed to worry about. If I give the effort and if I'm second, type thing. You and I should applaud effort. We should applaud faithfulness. And certainly applaud success knowing that it was that person's effort that led to it. And give God the credit and praise. Hey, every one of us in here had to borrow a brain. Hey, none of you here because of your own self. God has given you all of it. So all the credit and glory goes to God. And so I'm good with winning. Lord knows that. But it's got to be in the proper perspective. Winning at all costs is wrong. Winning for personal pride is wrong. Winning for significance and security for self-esteem is a trap. And there's only one way to fight these sins. Submission. Submission first to Christ. You see, no one wins against Christ, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, I like to put that in that we have fallen short of what God intended. God intended a personal love relationship with us that's real and personal, and as a result, that brings glory to God. But our sin has caused us to fall short of that. Well, here's the, that's the bad news. Here's the good news. But Christ won for you. Christ won for you. For you. There's a famous Southern Gospel song. You may not know it because Southern Gospel is not what it used to be on the on popularity, and that's okay. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. It's so true. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ 
our Lord. So everyone who submits to Christ and confesses their sins does what? Becomes a winner. Everyone that accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior becomes a winner and learns the valuable lesson of life. Many times to win, you have to lose. Many times to win, you have to lose. Jesus said it this way, deny yourself and pick up your cross, follow me. Well, what's that? That's submission. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. I said this in first service. I want to say it here in second service. Uh, Mandy, Connie Pulse, many, many others in our uh, fellowship here has shown us uh, what self-denial in the area of physical health looks like, uh, and, and praise God for that. And that, I know that that's individual, that's between you and God, so I'm not picking on anybody here. But you know my struggle. I've shared it with you. You know that me and my doctor are in a disagreement. <laughs> okay? He's right, though. Now, he's wrong in one area. He says I wasn't trying. He doesn't know how many times I passed DQ. He doesn't know that. Okay? Now, it's obvious I haven't passed it enough. <laughs> and that's where I have had to acquiesce. That's where I have had to submit. That is where I have had to absolutely say, you're right. Watch this. I'm not trying hard enough. Church, I wasn't trying hard enough. And we all have areas of our life that we will not argue with people that they're out of bounds. But what we will argue with is whether we're trying or not. But that doesn't need to be the issue for you. for you. For you, it needs to be, am I trying hard enough? And God is asking us in this area of submission to try harder, to make sure that you're doing this. Proverbs uh, puts it this way. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Another verse in Proverbs says, lean not unto your own understanding, but acknowledge all your ways unto God, and he will direct your paths. And yes, that's a BK paraphrase. And one of my personal favorites in Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath. One of my favorite stories about this, uh, Aaron Maxwell, uh, the pastor at Friendship Baptist Church years and years ago. Uh, Steve Reed was his Awana commander at that time. And they had to send a young man home, and the dad was not happy at all. And so the dad called Aaron, and it didn't go well. And he said, where are you at? And Aaron said, I'm here at church. And he said, stay there, I'm coming. True story. Now, if you don't know Aaron Maxwell, he's as wide as he is tall. Probably would have been a poor choice for this guy to take on Brother Aaron Maxwell. But Brother Aaron's a Christian. He's pastor. He stands a lot to lose by getting in a kerfuffle, if you will, with a disgruntled parent. He knew this verse. So he had a few moments while the fellow's driving to friendship to straighten Brother Aaron out. And when he comes, Brother Aaron meets him with, what can we do to work this out? Please notice the tone of my voice. When you are in a heated situation, if you will lower your tone so much that they have to, what? See, so they have to stop and they have to, because they want to hear what you have to say, because they're hoping that you will escalate it and get it really going. But, it, but if you would just respond with a soft tone, all of a sudden now they're having to use this sense instead of this sense. And it absolutely diffused the situation. Now, I want to say something here. If you think that pastors, as men, don't have the desire to straighten those people out, you, you're kidding yourself. I've got the same manly flesh to overcome that you have. But I'm telling you, watch this, church. It's so much more beneficial for any Christian to respond to the Word of God and the Spirit of God and not resort to violence if we can at all avoid it. Defend yourself. You know I'm not saying don't do that. But there's so little of that that needs to happen. Instead, when things start to escalate, you've got to de-escalate. What is that? Submission. A soft answer turneth away wrath. That works in marriages too, just so you know. <laughs> so here in 1 Peter chapter 3. We have a continuation of Peter spelling out what a daily practical holiness looks like. 
Now he takes a fine-tuned, if you will, a scope-like look into the family. And in this passage, he once again supports this biblical view of winning by submission. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, again, likewise, I'm sorry, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward arraigning the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious. So we have here point number one. And, and I apologize, I got confused in where my scripture was. Point number one, the reason for submission is in verse one. What is the overall biblical view of submission to women in particular, but also to people, Christians, if you will, in general? I want us now to look, if you have a Bible and you want to turn there, please feel free. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. This, if you will, is the premise on submission and, and how a wife and a husband works together. Wives, be in subjection unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, being himself the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives also be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. That, that cannot be overstated. Husbands, love your wives. You know why it can't be overstated? He attaches it to Christ's sacrifice. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Even so ought husbands also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his own wife loveth himself, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and, and cherisheth it, even as Christ also the church. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I speak in regard of Christ and of the church. Nevertheless, do ye also severally love each one his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see that she fear her husband. Now, please hear me. If you didn't get on the train and you hop on now, you're probably not going to get it. So get this on YouTube or BethelLondale.com and re-listen, because I'm fixing to say the meat of submission. Biblical submission in marriage is a wife making a choice not to overtly resist her husband's will. That is not to say she cannot disagree with him or that she cannot express her opinion. Indeed, a wife who practices submission is by definition a woman with strength of character. The overall reason for submission is in a marriage, I'm sorry, the overall reason for submission in a marriage is structure and biblical harmony. Are men and women created equal? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is no unevenness at the cross. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Dawn and I stand level at the foot of the cross. I am not superior to Dawn because I am a man. She's not superior to me because she's smarter than me, even though she is. Widely, grossly smarter than I. But we're still equal in God's eyes. Absolutely. And please listen to this. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ, there can be neither Jew nor Greek, there can be neither bond nor free, there can be neither male nor female, for you are all one man in Christ Jesus or woman, for we are all one person in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to promise. In our day, we are mistakenly defining equality as sameness. It's not right. Equality cannot be equated to sameness. Watch this. That is a blindness to our uniqueness. Any man that thinks that he's the same as a woman needs to go with me to the maternity ward. I'm telling you, there's a difference. And I love the French uh, congressman years and years ago. Viva la difference, meaning long live the difference. Yes, we... There is absolute wonderful enjoyment to buy in to the difference. 
One fellow said, in response to loving their children equally, if you are loving your children equally, you will love them uniquely. You will. It's not sameness. <laughs> they ain't the same. Molly and Benjamin and Tony only have one likeness, my DNA. Besides that, they're different as all get out. They're different as all get out. And so if I'm going to love Molly, I'm not going to love her the same way I love Tony. If I'm going to love Tony, I'm not going to love him the same way I love Benjamin, so on and so forth. And can I tell you, I wish it were that way. It would be so much easier. Yeah. But no, we want to be loved for our uniqueness. And it's so important that we understand that. And then in this verse specifically, now, now we're getting to exposition, because in my humble opinion, this, this submission idea has got to be dealt with so much more than just the first Peter context. In this verse specifically, what Peter is getting at by telling the women to be submissive, it seems like he's going for a particular end game. Yes, most definitely. Too many times in our world, the lost of this world understand who and what we are to be as Christians better than we do. And even in this day, lost men knew, meaning in the day of 1 Peter, lost men knew that Christians were to be humble and meek and, yes, have a servant attitude. And so for a woman in this culture to not submit to her husband's leadership, it did nothing but bring strife and conflict into the home. So Peter is saying that if and when your lost husband sees your submission to him, not as your superior, but as your leader, in God's eyes, that will be a witness to him. And so the purpose for submission in a family is nothing but structural. We used to say the word hierarchical, but, but that has a bad name these days. And so I'm sure they'll come up with a, something bad about structure one of these days. But for me, that's the best word to describe. God wanted everyone in the family to know how the family works best. But you as men and women must know he didn't make that decision based on any kind of inequality between men and women. He didn't. We can ask him when we get to heaven. <laughs> but, but he put it for structure. He, when there's an issue with the family, he's going to come to the man. Now, one of the things, in my humble opinion, ladies, that has been a help for Dawn and I is that if you will see this act of submission ultimately as a submission to God, God is lovingly asking you to do this for the sake of the family. And, and honestly, you know, we're not going to get into the, all the nitty-gritty of what this is because, honestly, that's between you and God. You and the Word of God and the Spirit of God can figure this out. And it's so important that we do that. Point number two, the result of submission. Verse two, the best testimony to a lost person is a vibrant love relationship with Jesus Christ that is exemplified by Christian conduct in a healthy fear of God. Look at that verse two, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. A wife spending daily time with God and allowing God to change her to look more like him is going to be attractive to that husband towards God. I'm not saying that there won't be conflict. In fact, Jesus promised conflict. He said, I have come to bring a sword between father and son. I've come to bring a sword between mom and daughter. What does he mean by that? He means that that verse in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That offends everyone that's not a Christian. And you've got to be ready for that. And so there's going to be some rough, you know, if, if you're sitting here and you are in the context of 1 Peter, you have an unbelieving husband, you're going to go through some conflict. You are. But your chaste conversation, that means your love relationship with Jesus Christ is going to point him to Christ. And that's what God is asking you to do. Point number three, the real object of submission, verses three through six. And so here in these verses, that vibrant love relationship with Jesus, uh, in, with Jesus Christ is spelled out. The hidden person of the heart, incorruptible, beauty, gentle and quiet spirit, precious in God's sight. Are you, are you listening to that? God is telling you the virtue, virtues of a close relationship with him. And this goes to men or women. When you and I 
have a close relationship with Christ, it's beautiful. It's gentle. It's meek. What, what does that word mean? Power under control. Power under control. You remember the, the funny story, Benjamin, about 12, 13 years old, and we're cleaning out the dog pen, and I'm barking orders at Benjamin, and I don't think he's doing it right. And I scream his name, and when I screamed his name, he came over with the water and hits me right in the face. <laughs> his mother very wisely said, run! <laughs> and Benjamin dropped the hose and ran. And I'm sitting there. <laughs> I'm already mad. I'm already mad because the boy's not doing it right, you know. And I've told him to do it right. But probably I haven't showed him how to do it right. Now, can I tell you that my flesh wanted to chase him down? That's what my flesh wanted to do. But the Spirit of God helped me, helped having Dawn right there. I can't remember if she started petting me, but she might have. That, that works sometimes. <laughs> Easy. Easy. <laughs> Actually, she knows better than that. <laughs> this is what happened. Bless him, Lord. You know. And that was years and years ago, praise the Lord. But I, I think you see what I'm saying. Gentle. And sometimes it's in the heat of the moment. So a soft answer turneth away wrath. And, and aren't aren't you, isn't it just so cool? That when you work through those moments, and then just a few moments after, you're just laughing hilariously at the silliness of it all. And, and, and you, get, you get things done. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. So, precious in God's sight. Right now, I can only think of one other time that God uses that phrase. The death of his saints. The death of his saints is precious in his sight. So is a Christian practicing submission. It's precious in his sight. And that's the real object of submission, a close, personal relationship. I heard a preacher say one time that after he preaches, you know, we, we've gotten away from this a little, and I think that's okay. It's probably even good. But back in the day, in the 80s for sure, in the 90s, it, it was the practice, and I still stand back there, but, but it, it's not what it used to be, and, and again, I'm okay with that. But it was kind of expected for every church member to walk by and say, good job, preacher, good job, preacher. And I dare say some of those folks had to ask for forgiveness after they said that to the preacher. I don't know. And so I don't ever worry about that. If somebody does say that, hallelujah, praise the Lamb. But, but, but that's not what I'm looking for. After I'm done here, I go to the cross and say, how'd I do, Dad? How'd I do? And you know what you face on a daily basis. You know what challenges are there. And when you face those challenges and get through those challenges, that can be your same response. How did I do, Daddy? How did I do? You see, that is a close, personal love relationship with Christ. Point number four and the last point, the reciprocal nature of Submission. Now, that's a big word. That's a $15 word, if you will. It just simply means you get a receipt, you give it back. You reciprocate. You, get, you give something, they give it back. Now, you and I should live life not expecting those things. But God is telling you that if you submit, you're, there's going to be some reciprocating happen. And we have this in this passage. Because husbands... It's not all on the wives. In fact, this is the only passage that I'm aware of that it deals with submission that he starts with the wives because the husband is the initiator of the covenant. The husband is the one that God, if you will, takes toes the line with. And so he, Peter writes this to the husbands. Look at it. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. I think you can argue that in other places in Scripture, the onus is put on the husband first, even though in this particular passage, the admonition for husbands to love their wives is after the plea to the wife to submit to him. 
I think biblically, again, you can make the argument that the husband's example to the wife comes first. But one reciprocates the other in no particular order in real life. Church, in real life, at the start of the day, you may actually see the wife that starts this for whatever reason. If something comes up and someone needs to show submission, the wife may be the first one. And that's okay. But many times it's the husband. That's okay. You don't need to worry about which one comes first. You just need to make sure both are doing it. That's the key. And, and so you might say, well, Brother Ben, how can a husband be submissive to his wives? I am so glad you asked. By meeting her needs. By meeting her needs. By being attentive to her needs. By figuring out what they are. Did you notice the very first phrase? Live with her according to love. I've shared this many times, but we've got new people here. It was just a few years after we got here. And at that point, you and I had been married not even 10 years. Is that right? So seven-ish. So we were still pretty new to each other. And I was having an issue. I was mad. Because she had a demand upon my time. I didn't like it. I didn't like that she didn't like that I did stuff without her knowing about it. So on and so forth. And I was having a problem. And on that parking lot, I was walking from this office to that house where we live, and the Holy Spirit stopped me on that parking lot and said, what you have is an issue with her having a rightful demand upon your time. You see, Ben, you're not 50 and 50. You're 100, 100. You're one. And when you act on your own, you tore stuff up. Mm. Can I tell you, no one can get a point across like the Holy Spirit. And that was one of the starts of a, of a healing that needed to happen in our marriage. Live with her according to knowledge. The woman don't like chocolate. So I don't give her chocolate no more unless I want to eat it. And you know I shouldn't have chocolate. But it's always a thrill when all of her students give her chocolate. I'm like, bring it home. Bring it home. She's like, I am not. You're diabetic. Uh. <laughs> Live with her according to knowledge. Giving honor to the wife. Giving honor to the wife. You and I are to honor one another. We are to honor our wives. Our wives are to honor us. But here it is. As to the weaker vessel. Now, I, again, I'm not trying to be anything but real. I'm not trying to shoot at anything or anyone. But isn't it is interesting to watch the world go through the gender confusion that they're going through and all of a sudden, in sporting events, these young men, because they call themselves female, they're winning the championships against females. Now, now, wait a minute. We've been told for 50 years that there's no difference. Sameness. Any woman can do anything that any man can do. Now, I'm going to tell you, if that's true, the reverse is true too. Any man can do anything a woman can do back to the maternity ward. Back to the maternity ward. Now, outside of these walls, it sounds like I'm putting women down. I'm not on any level. I'm trying to get men and women to obey the biblical roles that they've been given. You will find satisfaction and absolute freedom within those roles. Husbands, you're to treat your wife with honor as the weaker vessel. Oh, so inferior, not on any level. Different, unique. And it's so important that we embrace those roles. It's so important. As difficult as it may be. Husbands, you will absolutely help your case if you obey Scripture. You live with her according to knowledge. You give honor to her. You Treat her as the weaker vessel, heirs of life. Church, it takes two to tango. 
if you got children, it took both of you type thing. And it's important that as fathers, and, and I know I know our fathers, you love your children. You love your grandchildren even more uh, and the such. And that's okay. Watch this. Took her. Took you. Took both of you. As heirs of life together. Oneness. Oneness. That is the goal of marriage. Now, I'm ending on this part because we're out of time, I'm sure. But this is the most powerful part of the message. If you got on the train at the beginning, then we're all here together. I hope and pray we made it. What does it say? That your prayers be known who? It's making an assumption, church. He's assuming that you're praying together. He's assuming that you're praying, husband. He's assuming that you're praying with your wife. But you've got to live with her according to knowledge. You've got to treat her with honor. And you've got to treat her as the weaker vessel with honor to get the prayers answered. That's powerful stuff. As the musicians come, I want to just talk to you. When I was uh, Daryl's age, there was a ministry starting called Promise Keepers. And Promise Keepers had a founder. His name was MacArthur. He was the head coach of Colorado University football team at the time. And he pushed this practice. His marriage had had a very rough start. And he healed God, healed the marriage by him doing this. And I've said it many times, but he would place his hands in an appropriate way, a non-sexual way, on the head or the shoulders, and he would pray over his wife. I've done that for many, many years, not every day, I'm ashamed to say, but I've done that for many, many years. It's a blessing every time I do it, and it's important. It's been interesting to see the different levels, if you will, of how people in my family respond to that. Husbands, if you were raised by an emotionally disconnected father, this is going to be difficult. I was. I was raised by an emotionally disconnected father can remember the first time he told me he loved me. I was 40-something years old. I know what it's like to not really know if your dad loves you. Now, we've talked about this. A lot of that was immaturity on my part, not seeing with my eyes what he did for me. It showed me he loved me. But I needed, in my mind, that affirmation. I needed those words. I needed that touch. Didn't get it. And so then I get married, and I'm the gift uh, love language of touch, but I've got it all confused and all turned around. And the Holy Spirit, God's Word, and godly men helps me understand that I can go to my wife and children and touch them in appropriate ways, and I can pray God's blessing upon them. This is what he's talking about, that your prayers be known who. What changes would happen in our families, if our pastors, if our pastors of our homes, that's you, Dad, if our pastors of our homes started laying on hands and praying God's blessings upon their wives and children. And I'm not saying you're not doing that. And I, I shared this with the first service. This is kind of a big deal to me. And I'm tempted to just Bear her down. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, the word is entreat. I'm, I'm going to beg you. I'm going to beg you to do it. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be funny, so help me out and laugh in just a second, okay? <laughs> if, you are, if you were raised by an emotionally disconnected uh, father, do this. Hun, just stand right there. Close your eyes. Lord bless her. <laughs> That's a start. Score. It's a start. And yes, I'm saying that to be funny, but watch this. Can I tell you, as a fellow that didn't know how to emotionally connect, it may have to start there. And wives, you better you better take that and just, mm, hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Don't you dare discourage him. Don't you dare. You may just simply want to hold her and pray silently. I'm okay with that. Let's just do it. And then husbands, I'm praying for a day 
but you'll turn to her. It's like, hey, I now need you. Just pray for me. About two weeks ago, I laid in the bed before first service time to come over here. I said, I, I got to have you pray over me. And she did. I don't do that very often, four, five, six times a year. But every time I do it, oh, my goodness, it's important that our prayers be not from him. Now, what happens when husbands and wives start praying over each other? Husbands and wives start praying over, moms and dads start praying over kids. Healing starts happening. Family starts transforming. We're going to go to three services. We're going to go to four services. We're going to get up on the hill, yada, 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 because the world will see transformed people. Let's all stand. If you're here today and you've never, ever received Christ, I'm begging you. You know, I haven't done this in a long time. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I mean, please, every eye closed. If you're here today and you've never, ever prayed what we call the sinner's prayer, but you're ready. You know that you're a sinner. You know that you deserve eternal punishment. You know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, and you're ready to settle it. You want to accept Christ as your Savior, and you want to move forward in your relationship with Christ. I'm going to ask you with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to raise your hand that if you pray this sinner's prayer with me, Brother Ben, I will absolutely receive Christ as my Savior right now. Is there anyone that would raise their hand for that? Anyone? You, you would absolutely do that right now. Here we go. Here we go. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have done things that have displeased you. And I'm asking you to forgive me. I know that I deserve eternal punishment. So I'm asking you right now to forgive me of my sin, come into my heart, and be my Savior. Thank you, God, for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we would love to talk to you after service. If you want to walk this aisle and submit uh, to church membership, baptism, whatever the case may be, we would love to do business with you right now. This is an invitation. We're inviting you to come forward. Let's sing. Husbands, you want to come pray for your family? Wives, you want to come? Please do so. Lord.